It's really exciting for me to be here. This is my third BAM AGM, and it's been quite a number of years, actually, since I've been to one. Uh, so I was really excited when this worked out. Um, when I started, I really just kind of hoped I would be able to make a living making mosaic. I knew I liked doing it, and I thought, wow, if I could do this and I could actually pay my rent and eat and do all that stuff, that would be really great. And I really didn't know that mosaic would really literally change my life. It, um, the process of picking up a piece of, of a mosaic tile or a piece of marble or some kind of tessera and putting it down and picking up another one has led me on quite a path and I'm honored to, that I can share that journey with you. Um, that whole concept of one tessera at a time is something that connects all mosaicists throughout history. Uh, we have all of that in common with the Sumerians three, oh, 5,000 years ago, I guess 3,000 BC, through the Greeks and the Romans and the Byzantine, and it hasn't changed. We still pick up one piece as contemporary artists. We make a choice about it. We make decisions about it, and we stick it down, and then some of us scrape it back up again and do it again. <laughs> but it's a thread that really connects all mosaicists. Um, the thing that differentiates, di oh, English, please, differentiates mosaic art from many other art mediums is the fact that there's this great interplay that goes on between the visual imagery that one is trying to express, whether it be um, figurative or realistic or an abstract, and the individual pieces. Even when you've created this entirely great, evolved, intentional kind of piece of work, the mind's eye still understands all of those individual pieces are what goes together and makes that imagery happen. Uh, this is a piece uh, that you see on the screen from Carthage. This is a detailed shot of an ancient mosaic from Carthage. And it's the same thing. It was one piece for them. It's one piece for all of us. Um, for me, it's a lot of different pieces, actually, because I, I apparently can't control myself. But it's another kind of interplay is what keeps me involved and keeps me working in mosaic. And the second interplay is not just the visual one between the imagery of the whole and the understanding of the inter individual pieces, but it's the interplay between how we work. It's the intellectual and um, mental head time stimulation part of it versus the physical, technical skills part of it. And there's a real balance in that, and that's, I think, one of the things that keeps me in, um, you know, interested and keeps me involved. When I mentioned before that as mosaicists, whether ancient or contemporary, we make a choice about a piece, and then we choose that piece, and we stick it down in however we, we think the right fashion is and where it ought to be. For me, the choice is about a lot of different things. It's about reflectivity. It's about scale and shape and spacing, the interstices and what happens in the spacings, and the juxtaposition of one kind of thing next to the other. So it's all of those different kinds of choices that are, are what makes my work interesting to me. And some things are in the macro, and some things are in the micro. And again, that's another interplay, another balance between the visual imagery and the individual pieces, the balance between the head time and the mental involvement and the technical skills and the physicality of it, and what we're seeing at a very small level and what we're seeing at a very great level. All of those things sort of combine for me um, and keep my love of mosaic really strong. But things really haven't changed all that much. I'm so happy I had this slide, Gary. <laughs> yes, and we didn't talk first either. But this is a fourth century bas relief, a carving in marble from Ostia Antica, which is the ancient port of Rome. And you can see there's this, and these people are all slaves. We feel like slaves, but they really were slaves. Um, you can see the man with his little hammer and hardy and his stump, <laughs> just like Gary had. And he's, looking, he's sitting marginally more comfortably than you were, Gary. Yeah. But you can also see the other slaves in the background with their incredibly bent backs carrying the big sacks of, of already formed pieces, of marble pieces, uh, off to the job site. And the man, another man on the right with a hammer and hardy and his little basket of pieces with uh, Tessera spilling out. 
Um, not that much has changed. Today, I mean, I still work with Hammer and Hardy. Many of us do, and the pleasure of that click when it's not a clock. I think of it, uh, the way I say it to myself is it sings when it's right, and it's off tune when it's not right. Uh, but, um, but I love the actual work. I love the physicality of it. I love shaping the pieces. I love sticking them down. I almost love scraping them up and sticking them down over and over again until they make sense to me, but uh, the process for me is what the art is. It's the doing of it, and the actual mosaic itself is really for me a souvenir of whatever journey that piece took me on, but it's the process of making it. Um, I use Hammer and Hardy, I use nippers, I use all kinds of hand tools to cut and shape pieces. I don't use power tools. Uh, it's not that you shouldn't, it's just something for me, it doesn't feel right. If you can't, um, if you can't, if, uh, if I can't make that piece and that tessera bend to my will and be what I want it to be, then I can't use it. I, I don't sand the edges, I don't grind. Um, it's really a personal challenge for me to be able to make it work. It's a particular kind of level of masochism I don't recommend, but <laughs> that just happens to be my level of masochism. The materials haven't changed all that much either, whether we're getting materials of, of marble art, yard on the left in the foothills of Italy, or from various manufacturers of molded glass tiles. That's a wall in my studio on a particularly clean, neat day. Everybody says my studios always look so neat. That's because those are photo shoots. <laughs> and because I was raised in the South, I am obligated to clean house before anybody can come over. The rest of the time, everything's crunchy and messy, so you can feel better about that. Um, but mosaic is ca uh, captivating for me on many levels. Just acquiring the materials is you know, engaging, finding them and gathering them. And my assistant, I have a part-time assistant who works on commissions with me and she says, I have a sable, I have a stash, I have stash, stash acquisition beyond life expectancy. So <laughs> my challenge is to live long enough to use at least half of what I've bought. Um, I love visiting mosaic sites. I love looking at what the ancients have done. I love feeling our connections to the past. And Sometimes those connections are physical and sometimes they're emotional. Uh, this was this summer, I went to Merida in Spain and uh, the mosaicists there, I felt like, I started to say queen for a day, but I was, it, I was told it was Prince of Pace of Mosaic for a day <laughs> because they showed me such a great time and this was at Merida where the, the people that ran that ancient site took the chains down, let me walk out on the mosaics, I was like, can I take my shoes off? And they said yes. And so that's what could be cleaner feet, those are my feet, standing on the cosmological mosaic in Merida in Spain. And I mean, it was really quite interesting to be standing on that ancient mosaic with the contemporary mosaic toes going, oh God, these feel right. Uh, so um, I've learned over the years that I think, especially I think when we're artists, I think everything is additive. Everything has value, um, it all counts. The art that each of us make is uh, a totality of all those stimuli, all those different things that we take in, and that's what makes it all unique and what, what makes our ability to express what we have to express individual and important and differential, and it's also what lets us put great big zeros, we hope, on the end of our price tags, because what we do is individual and something only we can do. Uh, everyone's story's different, and we all have something to say. Um, there was a great quote by Steve Jobs, the guy that started Apple Computers, and it really resonates with me, and it's that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You don't know what you do now, how that's going to work into what you do later. Um, it all adds up, and it all adds meaning, and you just don't know how it's going to play out, and the adventure is really figuring out along the way how it plays out. I spend a lot of time looking at the world around me, taking in visual stimuli. I mean, those of you that follow my Facebook page are subjected to, would be probably the kindest way to put it, what a former boss of mine kindly called an active mind, which means I think that I have ADD and I bounce around a lot. But I take in a lot of information, and we all do. You know, I'm not unique in that. And that all comes out and is expressed in the kind of art that we create. Uh, so even though I work in a very contemporary vein, I spent a lot of time looking at ancient mosaics. Uh, this is the Monastery of Daphne in Athens, which is still being restored from the 1999 earthquake, which get, once I chatted my way in, gave me an opportunity to get up on the scaffolding and get up close and see how the Byzantines were 
shaping those pieces and how they were sticking them in and how they were tipping in. And even though I work very contemporarily, I think I learn a lot from looking at how somebody else does what they do. It's not to be discounted. You know, all of those experiences aren't to be discounted. So this is a really early piece named Riverscape. And this is a piece where I really started looking at mixing multiple materials. And suddenly I used what we call vitreous glass tile, that molded glass tile that's very flat and juxtaposition with small t. And suddenly I saw differences in height, working on grouted, direct into cement-based adhesive. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is, I just saw new ways of trying to get closer to what I was seeing in my head. And then I added pebbles into the mix and it was just an explosion for me. I really realized what path at that point where I needed to be moving forward. And sometimes you find those, way, those pathways and you move back and you push forward again in a different direction. But that was something important to me. And as I learned sort of a new way of working and a new way of pulling materials together, um, I realized that my process had to be less preconceived. So the way I create mosaic, I tend to think of it in terms of intuitive mosaic. It has to feel right. And I find it as I'm going along. I spend a lot of head time thinking about things, but I try, for the, for the artwork, I try not to sketch very much. Because the more I know about what I think a piece is supposed to look like, the more I preconceived the work, the more it becomes a technical exercise for me because I can, I can cut tile and I can stick stuff down and make it look like it's supposed to look and I become, it's more like working to a brief and I feel like I miss a lot of opportunities to really understand the possibilities. So I try and pull back from that very comfortable spot of knowing what I'm gonna do into the very uncomfortable spot of trying to find out what this is going to be and how this process of discovery is going to play out. Um, for me, it's, if it's easy, it's probably not right. I really, it really has to be hard, and I have to work through it. And that, too, is my own particular sense of uh, satisfaction of getting to it, but a particular sense of probably somewhat low level of hysteria the whole time I'm working that I don't recommend. <laughs> um, I continued working with mixing materials, but then I moved to this piece, The Spaces Between. And I got this idea of working with one material and then eliminating the allure of all that combination of materials, one color, eliminating it down. So I was really, really looking at what happened with the interstices, with the spaces. And the only thing I had at the time that I could work with, because I thought of this at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, I decided this was the right thing to do, um, was I went out in my backyard and I had a, uh, pulled up part of my sandstone, stepping stone sidewalk. and chopped it up. Sandstone's really easy to chop on a hammer and hardy, by the way, let me just mention. Uh, although you have to be good because it takes a really crisp cut because it's so, it's so soft. But I chopped up the stopping, uh, stepping stone and sort of started sticking it down, and I learned an incredible amount from that. And it let me go back to that alluring mix of materials with a slightly, a perspective from a slightly different place. And I learned that by limiting the palette, I could focus in on rhythm and texture and spacing and um, the things that really interest me most about working in mosaic. Um, now I always work from two points of view. I look at the tessera as the positive pieces and the interstices or the spaces as the negative spaces. And sometimes I work just from the negative and sometimes I work from the positive and theoretically I sort of try and make them both make sense. But it gives me a way, a different way of thinking about my work. So I'd like to show the process that I use making a mosaic. Um, I want you to understand just how hard this is. No, I think you all know just how hard this is. Um, and I want, to, I want you to understand this is just how I work. This isn't the right way to do it. This isn't the only way to do it. This just happens to be the way that I've found that works for me and lets me get closer to what I want to express with every piece. Um, I have to be able to have that freedom to understand what all these different pieces are. So this is the start of a piece called Meltdown. And the pieces, I wish I could get, oh, I have a pointer, don't I? <laughs> the pieces here in sort of what's the lower right-hand corner, those sort of all ended up coming together. But I pulled out all these things that were interesting to me that um, I thought had possibilities. And I was pushing them around. And I pushed probably eight of those pieces around for four or five days. I was at a very, well, a reasonably low level of hysteria throughout the beginning of this whole piece because I couldn't make sense of them. They weren't coming together. And um, I was like, you know, okay, flash in the pan. 
everybody's going to know it was all PR. You weren't really ever going to make another good mosaic again. You know, there was a lot of, it was fraught with a lot of negative self-talk. But ultimately, who knew? It started coming together, and it was driven by the materials. Um, I start with a particular piece of stone that I like, and I just keep going. So this is a gathering of slate from Cornwall and collapsed calcedony geodes from Brazil that I bought in New Zealand of all places, and pieces of broken raku pottery that my mother made, and some pot blew up in the kiln, and I was like, I'll have that, thank you. Um, and um, it started working. And I learned, although at the time I was hysterical, I learned not to begrudge that head time, that pushing those pieces around the board, because I started understanding what was going to happen. And I started understanding more, and more pieces started coming together. And um, it, it, despite the frustration, that time was incredibly important in how the work evolved and what happened with the work. And choosing to work with a wide range of materials is it's, it's problematic because you know, I, I, I sense that people probably look at my work and go, oh, you know, she just picks up a whole bunch of stuff and she sticks it all down and they all kind of go together because it's all similar color vein and it's interesting. But at least from my side, it's much harder than that because I get one piece down and that looks good and you get the next piece down and that looks good and you put the third piece down next to it. My God, oh, this is going to be so great. This will be the best thing I've ever done. And then you put the fourth piece down and you're like, oh, no. <laughs> This is not right. So it's this interweaving, this back and forth, this, this, this looks good, this changed everything, now everything's got to come up, and there's a lot of back and forth and whatever. But ultimately, if I'm happy with how it all goes together, then you know all of that was worth it. If I'm not happy with it, you won't see it in the slides, I'll just say that. Um, but unlimited choices and scale and texture and reflectivity, whatever factions are, are or principles of mosaic that you choose are the ones that you want to work with and focus on, and there's lots to choose from, the more that you bring into the mix, the more complex those decisions become. Um, and it, working intuitively requires a certain amount of openness. You have to be willing to look for what's happening that's going to change everything that you do. And it's much easier not to stay open to those things because, you, you know, I'd actually finish more work if I didn't. But I'm sort of in this for the long haul, so I want to keep finding what's new and what interests me and, and where I'm going to you know, head next in the whole thing. Um, for me, mosaic is a really great or, or, or it, it, important chance, important way for me to be expressive of what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, and it's a way for me to really make sense out of a very complex world. And I think that's probably why my pieces end up very, being very complicated. I'm trying to pull all of this together and, and breaking it down to its smallest pieces to the tessera, and how they work together allows me to uh, say something emotional for me about the world around us and what we see and complex issues and how we come to terms with all of that. <laughs> Um, you can't really hurry mosaic. It's slow. There's a lot of time for reflection. At least it's slow for me. I mean, I think the longer I work, the slower I get. Uh, I'm thinking about more things, and I'm, I'm pretty much down to working at some sort of glacial ice age pace at this point, <laughs> sadly. Um, so you hear I'm starting to work in the background, figuring out rhythm, uh, figuring out what's going to happen next. The uh, piece continues to evolve and grow, and you can see that's about as much drawing as I'll do on a piece. I, and you can see at the top where I had one shape, and I just said, mm, maybe not so much, and I just kind of scratch scratched it out at some point and moved on to another one. And then this is the finished piece, and that's how it all came together. And it was titled Meltdown for multiple reasons. Um, Harvey helped me name it, and I said, we've got to come up with a name. And he said, tell me what it's about, and I'm like, hot forces, fire of the earth, annealed copper, burnt raccoon, and I'm getting into it, and I'm marketing to myself now. He goes, oh, I've got the name. And I said, what is it? He said, meltdown. I was like, oh, that's so good. He goes, nothing to do with what you said. You were just in a major meltdown the whole time you made that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> but commissions are different. Uh, this is just trays of selection materials. I do a lot of work at the Children's Hospital in Dallas, so those projects usually, not always, but usually have a lot of color, uh, just with the idea that it's, I want the work to be child right, but not childlike. 
Uh, commissions have a lot of more things to think about. There's clients, the ones paying the money, and then there are the client groups, the people who are going to see the work. So for the children's hospital, that's the kids, that's the nurses who are going to look at it all day, all year. Uh, the parents, doctors, people walking by, the cleaners who are bumping the cleaning carts into it, let's not go there. Um, so far, everything survived. Uh, but then there's always the art. There's the practical and technical considerations, but overall, there's always the art. And for me, that's the most important thing, to be able to maintain an artistic vision and have that be expressive of what I do while keeping all of those other sort of things balanced. So all of these different kinds of tesseras start coming together, and they have to pull together. And the project has to pull together just like the Tessera have to pull together. And it all has to make sense to all of those client groups, all of those users, has to make sense to a budget, God save us all, um, has to fulfill whatever the brief was, but it has to be a piece of art. It has to be successful for my artistic vision. So this was a piece that worked out for me and was that way. This is the uh, main lobby, the atrium of the Children's Hospital in Dallas, which is the I think it's the second largest children's hospital in America. And um, that was the wall that William Wegman, the guy that takes the beautiful photographs of the Weimar Honor dogs, William Wegman wanted that wall and they gave it to me and I was like, thank you. I love William Wegman, but I like my wall better. <laughs> so sometimes it'll work. Um, but here's a different kind of um, project. This is for a private residence, so the, uh, some of the issues aren't the same. It doesn't have to be cleanable like it is in a hospital. So this piece is ungrouted. Uh, this is a private residence. There's a, it has a stucco exterior, which was brought in through that entryway around, around a curved wall and dropping down some stairs. So this was a chance for me to do sort of a little bit of a proof of concept because um, on some of those big walls, there's always a background to deal with. So a lot of budget goes into background, and I wanted to put all the budget into these mosaic elements so, so it had as much impact as it was, and plus, I get sort of tired of doing backgrounds after a while. Uh, so this was a piece that ultimately was called Nebula Aqua. The mosaic was created on mesh, installed on site, but the real trick to this is that for these, to maintain the illusion of these nebula floating across the wall, there were great technical considerations because the edges had to be perfect. This stucco is incredibly textured and it's installed with black cement-based adhesive. Thank you, Lady Creek. Is the Lady Creek guy here yet? Well, he's speaking this afternoon, so you have to tell him how I spoke about his product. I am not worthy of how fabulous Leda Creek is, which I think they're just now opening up their distribution in England. I recommend it highly. Although, lots of great products in the world. That just happens to be the one I make. Um, the one I use. I don't make it. I just use it. Um, but these, uh, Nebula had to have these edges that were perfect because if there was some, I don't think this is a word, but splooge out from the edge, that illusion would be gone. That sense of these floating orbs that might be under a microscope or might be visions from outer space. So there was a huge amount of masking tape used. If you'd known ahead of time, I would have recommended buying stock in 3M because I bought lots of masking tape. And more time was spent putting masking tape on and off that wall probably than anything else about the installation. But developing a t technique for that to work was integral to maintaining the artistic vision for that. But it gave me a way now to sort of push it push my vision into larger site-specific um, settings. So there's a close-up of one of the nebula. There's one of them in, in its entirety in there. I think there's six or seven in that installation. I can't remember. I probably blocked that out. Uh, and then this is back to sort of what the hanging work. I, at that point, I wanted to push into the third dimension, draping light and tessera and reflectivity over uh, sort of complex curved shape. So I worked on this hand-formed substrate where I built pieces up and the nebula all kind of wave up and down, sort of like the flutes of a seashell. And then the background comes up and down in these complex curves between these raised areas. Well, ha, ha, ha me. I thought, well, I'll be clever. I won't use all those little tiny pieces, which would have been much faster to have those march up and down those complex curves. I decided to do crazy paving, opus palladiatum. Um, and do it that way because I like the non-directionality of that kind of background and it, the slight angularity of it juxtaposed with the really organic forms. I like how that works and I thought, well, I can just knock this out. I know how to crazy pay. Well, when things go down over a 3D form, 
and you want it to be smooth, when that end goes down, that end goes up, which means whatever pieces were going off in multiple directions from that end, everything now has to get readjusted. So I don't recommend that. Um, I've done it more than once, but that's just a level of masochism I don't wish on anyone. Uh, but it worked, and it took a long time, but it became deceptively calm and serene and peaceful, and I made, tried to make all of those disparate elements play nice together, which is really good because it's, you know, it's fraught with hysteria when it's being made, so it's nice if the result comes out and nobody actually realizes that until I make this confession, which I think is now going to be online somewhere. Um, the longer I work, the more I seem to be distilling mosaic, or what I'm trying to distill mosaic down to its most basic elements, tessera and substrate. So this is part of a series called Coded Messages. Uh, and I was, you know, I travel a great deal, and I don't, my language skills basically, as you can tell, English isn't all that good for me, so it's, it's, it's not any better in other languages. Uh, and I was thinking about codes and messages and misunderstandings and, and subtext and what people say and what they really mean. And I decided that I wanted to start working with that kind of concept, and I came up with the idea for the coded messages. But apparently it wasn't difficult enough for me, so I decided I really needed to, I mean, something in me needs it to be difficult. And I decided that these messages, because things change, I mean, you know, it's, the message isn't always the same, that I needed to put all of these tessera down uh, in a way that they didn't look like they were actually stuck. So there's no visible adhesive. So all of these pieces, even though you can't see the adhesive in them, those are all stuck. Uh, and it, you know, we think of mosaic as being set in stone. And these are set in stone, but you can't see that they are. So it, it brings a different sort of um, tenuous kind of understanding of whatever that message is. It brings it a little bit more uncertainty, I think. Um, it's, um, I think it's kind of interpreting conflicting messages that even if you think you've come to the meaning, the meaning's gonna change on you. Uh, this is the next one in that series, which was Coded Message in Visible Ink. Um, and that's part of what I hope and what I try to do is live an artist's life. And even though you think you've developed your voice, you don't wanna think you've developed, you don't wanna know that. Working intuitively means you have to be ready to listen to what that voice says at the time and how it's going to change and what new experiences are going to bring that, and, and you're looking for what's going to emerge next. Uh, and here's a close-up of the coded messages. I really think of these tesserus as, as the basic building blocks of mosaic. And every piece is important. Every piece has to be intentional. Every piece is a decision. I'm not filling space. And I think that's probably why I don't like background as much. Because it's sort of, even though in mosaic everything is the field, there really isn't a foreground and a background, but visually there's a foreground and a background. And I don't like the idea of filling space. I want everything to matter. So here's a different commission. This is the most recent commission I did. This is also at the Children's Hospital. Um, and this is for a 30, what's the 12 meter wall. I'm sorry, I was doing math and that <laughs> slows me down every time. The wall is about 12 meters. Uh, so there was quite a challenge. They had a new uh, floor that's the new Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders with a water theme. So this is called Aquasphere. And there are these floating, watery kind of elements. And this is actually one of the best sketches I've ever done in my life my, uh, for a commission. I mean, I sketch all the time, but for a commission, I try to always give the lousiest, crummiest sketch ever because I don't want to get tied to it. I don't want them to say, well, it doesn't look anything like the drawing. So when I, I showed my assistant the sketch after they accepted the job, she's like, I didn't even know you could do that. I was like, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, so this is my trusty assistant, Lee Davis, on the left. And this is a, a so I'm going to show a little bit of step-by-step -step of installing a commission because this is a great lesson in sticking to your guns and hopefully not getting sandbagged by the technical problems on a job. Uh, so in my contract, I specified a raw wall, not primed, not anything, just a raw wall. So we went down on our little site inspection, had our little vests on, our little hats on, and we're like, raw wall, beautiful. Will you take our picture? You know, it's like girls go to the job site. And we go back on install day, and the wall has been primed. <laughs> and can't stall on to a primed wall. It's a point of failure. So I walk in, and I'm like, mm-mm. And they're like, now, little lady, come on because it is still Texas after all. And these construction guys and all the suits are like, oh no, no you can't. I said, well really I don't think I can. 
But if you really want me to, as long as you'll sign off on a statement that it, when it falls off the wall, you'll pay me to do it again, I'll do it. Because I'm messing up their schedule. They're not happy about the whole thing. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And I'm like, hmm. So I said, let's call the technical people at Leda Creek. <laughs> Jason really ought to be here to hear this. Um, and I get, them, I get tech on the phone. And all of these, just if you're on the job site, all of these cement companies, all of these adhesive companies, they all have technical departments that are thrilled to help you with something beyond, I'm replacing a tile in my bathroom. So I get the tech guys on the phone, and I'm like, and I put them on speakerphone, and I'm like, so I'm on a job site, and I've come, and the wall is primed. And the guy's like, oh, you can't install on that. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm looking at the suits, and they're all like starting to walk away. And so we had to pull off the job site, and they had to pull the, they cut out the sheetrock where I was installing and reinstalled new sheetrock. So you can see on this next image, you can see, pointer, you see this is raw sheetrock here, and below the handrail, see how that's all primed? So they had to cut all that out. They hated my guts. <laughs> but I didn't care because I really didn't want it to peel off the wall. Uh, and the hospital didn't care either because they didn't want it to fall off the wall. So. It's shortened everybody's time frame. You have to be ready for those kinds of things. But as you can see, there's lots of masking tape and there's plastic. And these pieces are now starting to go up. And there, I staged that for the Lady Creek guy. He really does owe me. He's not here, but he's here in presence because we use Lady Creek sanded grout. And that was this hand-colored grouting process. And this is what it looks on a job site when you take a break. Basically, you're like, Wow, that looks really great. I wonder if I'll ever get up off this floor again. But basically, um, once again, lots of tape. So they're repealing tape off, and then it gets retaped for grouting because you just can't let it get on the wall because when you're doing these floating nebula or, or floating shapes on a wall, and there's not going to be any background. It's not forgiving. Uh, even though they were going to come back and prime and paint, I didn't want them sanding my mosaic off because they already hated me so much. Uh, and contrary to popular opinion, no mosaicists really suffered in the making of this one. But this was about 2 o'clock in the morning after the first part of the install, and this is really pretty much how you feel on a job site sometimes. <laughs> and here's the finished project. Uh, so this is Aquasphere in place now, and it's on the main entrance to the cancer and blood disorders floor. And, you know, hopefully, I think everybody there seems pretty happy with it, so I think the project worked out. And there's one of the individual floating water forms. There's a close-up of one of them. And this is the beginning of, a, of the last piece I'll talk about. Um, this is the way I start again. And this, uh, you know, I find an interesting piece of rock. The piece on the left is a piece of botrytal, I had to say that right, botrytal malachite with chrysocolla formation. And on the right, I thought, bingo, I found it. This is how they're going to fit together. The stuff on the right, I think almost all those pieces got used, but they were not in that shape. But at the time, I took a picture because I thought they were going to be in that shape. Uh, and it takes a lot of materials to do this. This is just a very small portion of what I was working with on that. There were this uh, one piece of artwork we're about to see has about 200 different kinds of tesser in it, which is, you know, I say that like I'm proud of it, but I'm not sure that's any, you have to really be careful working with a whole lot of stuff because you think it's going to look good. and and. It doesn't look like I can spell restraint, but I actually, you'd be surprised at how much restraint I actually use. Uh, and here it's starting to come together, and the shape on the right, right here, actually stayed pretty much like that. These completely changed once yet again. So here's, that's the, this piece was a framed piece because of where it, where it ended up. Uh, this has tape on the frame um, protecting the frame. Uh, here's the pieces that's starting to go together, and this is just the table next to the frame with a bunch of schmutz laying there, because I'm really messy when I work. Um, and that's a close-up of that first area that started. Here's a detail, and this one undulates also how the uh, background is going in and up and down and around and around in these complex curves. Uh, and that's the finished work. Um, and this is the piece that I'm on my way to Ravenna Mosaico for because this is the piece that's now the first piece by an American in the permanent collection of contemporary mosaic art at the Musée d'Arte de Ravenna. And this Ravenna Mosaico in a couple of weeks is where it's going to be presented. And anybody's there, I'm buying the Prosecco. <laughs> you need a drink, you come to me. <laughs> Thank you.
I, somebody said to me after this happened, they said, well, that has to be a dream come true. I want you to promise you I never even dreamt that. Um, I thought, first of all, I never really dreamt I'd get in a museum. If I did, I thought I'd be in Waxahachie, Texas, which, by the way, has no museums. Lovely small town, but no museums. Um, so I figured that would be my best shot because it'd be something new. Um, the longer I work in Mosaic, the more I realize I have no idea where I'm going, and I think I like that because that keeps me working at it. Um, some challenges are technical, some are conceptual, some are the same challenges that come up over and over again in new ways, but, and the work's engrossing and it's hard and it's obsessive, but I really wouldn't do anything else. Um, I think as mosaic artists, we are really uniquely positioned in the art world. I think we have something that's differential and something that the, you know, to some extent I think the fine art world has forgotten. I mean, there's a dialogue between the materials and the imagery that isn't always there. So I think that's something we really should exploit. Um, if we can create good mosaic art that has a relevance to our times, that's contemporary, um, that has thought and it speaks to the art issues of today, I mean, I think we have something um, that can enable our chosen medium to shine. And it's a challenge. And just as they spoke about uh, the article in BAM about craft versus art versus the Tate Museum. Oh, that was indiscreet, wasn't it? Um, but I, I, I think we can regain the kind of prominence that mosaic artists have had over the centuries. I see a lot of really great work being made. And a lot of, uh, many people, uh, many mosaicists now have gotten to a level of technical skill that's completely admirable. What, you know, what I think is really important is if we take those technical skills and use them to express our own personal vision, to express what's in our hearts, to express how we relate to the world around us, to help other people to see the world with different eyes, um, you know, I encourage you to take chances. Um, be passionate, create what you care about passionately. I mean, you really have to love what you do. Um, and make what's true with you. I really think we'll all see more mosaics in museums and maybe in the summer exhibition at the Royal Academy, which personally I've never gotten into, but I hope somebody does. Um, but I really look forward to seeing what everybody else in this room continues to create. I have put out on the share table, I put bookmarks out for everybody. Um, there's some catalogs on the BAM table that are available, but you know, I'd like to come back next time and see somebody else up here speaking and talking about what museum they've just gotten into, and I'm thrilled that I can share all of this with you all. Thank you.